Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on the legendary Jesse Prince. Jesse, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for the invite. It's great to be here. Jesse, before the show, you were telling me that you were sent to the Gold Base in 1978 at the personal orders of L. Ron Hubbard to be a staff auditor and to work on staff enhancement. What happened when you arrived at the base? When I arrived at the Gold Base, it was a time of transition. The mission holders uprising had happened at Flag. Uh, David Mayo had been sent to quell that uprising, and he apparently uh, failed miserably at that. And he himself had begun to be investigated and, and just treated horribly. So I came into it into that situation because, you know, I had known David from before. He was part of the team that we were on. He was the top of the team that I had been a part of and play, you know, all together, train people and work with people. And I had done videos for him and he had trained me. And, you know, we were all friends and I was very respectful of him. Jesse, would it be correct to say that at this time, David Mayo, wasn't he famous and acclaimed for having saved L. Ron Hubbard's life through auditing? Absolutely. He, I mean, we all knew this flag that L. Ron had gotten very sick and he was like dying. And Mayo went and began to audit him and, and they came up with this anyway, Ned Frotees, when it was all said and done. And, um, and he literally brought L. Ron back to life with this. So now you enter Gold Base, you're watching the fall of one of your heroes, David Mayo. Right, right. And then now I'm, you know, now I'm being told the mystery of what it meant, like what L. Ron was actually trying to accomplish when he was, said he wanted to find this person and bring them to him so that he could correct in management. Now I knew what he was talking about as far as correcting in management. Um... Well, well, explain what you mean. What was what was L. Ron Hubbard trying to fix? Well, I, it was it was a mess. It was a mess because uh, the whole mission uh, network was in a, a complete turmoil. I mean, they they were no longer one to go along with. They wanted nothing to do with Miscavige and um, his new uh, Scientology that was just kind of coming into existence. But before the Guardian's office pretty much ran all of the agreements and, 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 you know, whatever the mission made them sign their agreements to use the trademarks and they paid X percentage of their money and, and, you know, send people to flag and, and that was the deal. But L. Ron at some point, see, this gets into the crux of the story and, and, and L. Ron was desperate for money. Money became a bad a, a bad issue for L. Ron because he was under investigation by the Internal Revenue Service. They were getting him for a nurment. His he the, they had just taken money, and it, it was obvious that money was coming from any organization within Scientology for L. Ron's benefit. And uh, he there was no records to prove any kind of royalty structure, even though on paper it was supposed to be, but there was no paper trail for it. There was nothing to show that there was any structure to the money. And Now, now Jesse, the, what we're talking about, just for time frame, for uh, historical reasons, David Miscavige at this point, is he in the Sea Org or is he at ASI? David Miscavige had resigned from the Sea Org, and he's at Author Services. He's the chairman of the board of Author Services. Author okay, Services it becomes had become a priority, and again, it was because of what this thing that I was about to explain. Please, the the IRS was on it, and 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 it was obvious the money, all money, was inuring to Elron. Elron was being sued, had individual lawsuits against him. Now he had a criminal investigation against him by the IRS for Norman. And in order to even fight that, he had to show that he had his own money and it wasn't coming from the church. And so this is why ASI was rapidly brought into existence 
to act as his literary agent because, as I was saying, there was no paper trail. There was nothing in existence that showed any type of exchange of royalties of, of what percentage L. Ron was getting and what the legal structure was for a 501c3 to pay him for whatever he had due, you know, in the eyes of the law. They just did it haphazardly. He just spent the money willy-nilly, however the hell he wanted to. He had to start showing he had income. And for him to show that, that's why ASI had to immediately be brought into existence. They had to start defining the, where Elrond's money was coming from. And the missions became important because now uh, uh, there was an a urgency put on it, this, that whole thing because of Nibs. Oh, Nibs just drove him fucking crazy in 1983 when he went to the Riverside Court and said that his father was probably dead. No one had seen him. And, you know, Miscavige and them had taken over. Anyway, this became such an issue that, number one, it almost brought Elron out of hiding. And if it would have, the IRS and the Justice Department were waiting to carry his ass away. So it was very, very turbulent times. I mean, these were bad times. I had no idea how bad it was until I had been up all night, shred, you know, shredding advice is getting rid of evidence that he's running the show, you know, through these advices. It, it was just like from the moment that I got to that base, it's like you hit the ground running. Now, Jesse, I want to lay out a few things. Uh, and this is for our listeners because you were there. You, you actually live this. Sure. Okay. The corporate structure of the Church of Scientology is an organization called the Church of Scientology California. Right. Yes, now, see. Church of yeah, CSC, Church of Scientology, California. The problem is all monies from the Church of Scientology, California, inure to the benefit of founder L. Ron Hubbard. Exactly. And what you told me is that Author Services International, ASI, had to be created so that L. Ron Hubbard would have a legitimate income stream that he could point to as a, uh, you know, a for-profit entity. Right, exactly. And so David Miscavige has to help L. Ron Hubbard fend off an investigation by the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Yes, and the Justice Department was coming after him. He feels, uh, Mr. Hubbard feels the hot breath of the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. So, so this is where Larry Brennan works on corporate sort out. Right. A lot of advices are shredded that Ron wrote to try to destroy any evidence that he's actually running the church. Exactly. As the managing agent. Yeah. Now, now at the same time, the Guardian's office is melting down. The Mission Holders Massacre, the so-called Mission Holders Massacre, happened in October 1982. I was there for that. I was there for that. I was in the auditorium. Oh, my God. What happened when was, was the intent of the Mission Holders Conference to slaughter the Mission Holders? Absolutely. And, uh, and I'll tell you, and it, it goes back to Mayo, and I'll tell you what happened. Please. Mayo, and I'm just going to give away this little tidbit, and I'm not going to be specific like this, but Mayo was supposed to go and deal with the Mission Holders. He was supposed to quell the uh, uprising. He, he went there with a, he went on mission. You know, in Scientology, he takes their mission seriously. He was on mission with uh, Julie, and he was supposed to go there and 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 quell this uh, mission uprising because he was popular, and they would listen to him. You know, they would they wouldn't listen to Miscavige. They had already told him to go fuck himself. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Mayo was the only hope to go there. So he goes there, and oh my God. Kingsley Wimbush had invented this thing called de-dinging where, you know, the, and they, they were, that was like counterintention. Somebody puts counterintention on this, like they put a little ding on you and you got to right. unding them, de-ding them. And, and, and uh, Kingsley Wimbush figured out that management were the ultimate dingers. They were dinging the mission holders <laughs> and, uh, and they needed some de-dinging. So they figured out some auditing shit they were doing in, in there. And I'm, uh, L. Ron heard about this. And he lost it. So <laughs> that's when uh, mail was sent and he was supposed to handle them with this de-dinging Kingsley Wimbush. And then there was a whole nother thing that came to light at that time, Jeffrey. And, and you're going to have to remember this. Where it was 
called New Civilization or something about de de oppression, de op. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Operation de oppression. De oppression. That, that was also coming into existence at that time. And anyway, you know, they, they felt like, you know, we, we were being oppressed by management. Anyway, these missionaries and, and certain ones, they were just like on a roll. So mail was sent in to deal with these people. And what what happens? Mail goes in there and he's, you know, they tell, oh, you're dinging us, you know. And and we have to de-ding you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and we love you. So let's flow you some power. So they grab mail by the arms. Yeah. And starts stuffing money in his coats and his pockets and everything. I mean, they're just coming out of their pockets, just loading them up with cash. And and Mayo's just like he's 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 like he don't know what to do. He don't know what to do. He's like, my wow. God, what the hell's happening? So what does he do? He takes the money, he goes home, and he screws Julie, his mission second. They have sex, okay? <laughs> you know, it, 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 this can't get any worse, okay? So. Now he's got the money, and he's got these fucking mission holders. Now he's got this big withhold that he's having the sex with the woman. He's married to Meryl. She's in the senior CS in the office. Meryl, Julie, they were all together. This is like such a fading place. So not only does Mayo fail to handle the mission holders, but when he comes and gets his sex check, you know, now he's telling on himself about having sex, getting all his fucking money, and then they find the money in the shoebox. And that was it. As far as L. Ron was concerned, that was the plant in Scientology all along. He felt totally betrayed by mail. And it just set off a horrible set of events. I and mean, then now comes the running program. Now comes the truth rundown. Now comes the false purpose rundown. I was the pilot auditor for all of that shit. And uh, when, when L. Ron was inventing that, I mean, he... You know, male had to have his own separate pole. <clears throat> so anyway, by the time, again, this that's the mess I step into. This is what he wants me to help him sort out. So, I, you know, I, I see male and I'm like, male, you know, what, what the fuck you want from me? It's like, what do you want me to do? I can't, how can I even defend you? You went and you told on yourself and you've done this shit. What do you expect is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what were you thinking if any thinking was going on, you know? So all of that horribleness happened to Mayo. And uh, the truth is, he, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, he brought that on himself. Yeah, I, and I don't know that that's really widely understood. It's not at all. Oh, a whole nother story is, is told, trust me. But yeah. I, I tell the story. And, you know, and I've, and I've since talked to Mayo, and God knows I love him. And, you know, I, I, I have come to his defense. I've written, I've, you know, declarations, whatever. But the truth is the truth. And, you know, because, and, you know, and, and hindsight is twenty twenty. but Jeff, I mean, can you imagine in Scientology, I mean, what do you think would happen to anybody if they were on mission, they go out, they have sex, and they take money from the enemy? What do you, what the fuck do you think is going to happen? Oh, they, they sign their own death warrant. Thank you. It was, yeah. Yeah, and that's what happened. Yeah, and, and L. Ron Hubbard, the minute he feels betrayed, he's going to turn with the full force of his fury on you. Oh, yes. And he, I mean, it rained on mail. But, you know, I never would, I protected him as best I could through those turbulent times. Because, number one, I was the tech person. I would never do anything unless he was properly fed, properly slept. And I don't mean just one day of sleep. I mean consistently slept so that anything that we do is valid according to the auditor's code, you know, whatever. That had meaning to me at that time. But I never, I, I was not the person to do the gangbang sex check. I was not the person to wake someone up in the middle of the night and throw them on the meter because there's no fucking way I could do that. I was too trusted of a person to act that way. Now, Jesse, yeah, you. so you're brought in as a fix and... Coincident with L. Ron Hubbard being in deep trouble with the IRS, Pat Broker and David Miscavige are running money up to Hubbard at the ranch, right? Correct. Well, and you know, again, the money became an issue because Hubbard now 
had multiple lawsuits against him. His own son was coming after him. The IRS was coming after him. The Justice Department was coming after him. He needed to hire lawyers to defend himself. The church couldn't just jump in and defend him as they had before. They, there had to be some corporate, the, the corporate integrity to uh, have a, a prayer's chance in hell to overcome these, these issues. So immediately, that's why uh, ASI came into existence as a literary, literary agent. That's why he immediately gave the trademarks to uh, RTC, set it up as a separate organization so that it then did licensing and had the authority to get money from all of these other organizations like CSI, CSC, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then the uh, Church of Scientology, CS, CST, Church of Scientology of Spiritual Technology, was set up in the event that anything ever went bad with RTC. Uh, when I was uh, growing up watching the Apollo Moon program, mm -hmm. you had you had this giant Saturn V rocket with the boosters on top of it, and then you had the Apollo space capsule. On top of the Apollo space capsule, there was a little tiny rocket, so that if the big Saturn V blew up, you could get the hell out of there. Right. And, re and really, the ch uh, Church of Spiritual Technology was the ultimate escape capsule. We'll put all the rights in there, and it's not connected to the church. Exactly. Now, it, in this whole mess, they created Church of Scientology International. Right. Religious Which, Technology. That was created to take the place of CSC, because CSC was being sued. So... You know, RTC took the trademarks and then it kind of brought CSI into existence by now l licensing them, having a specific license agreement with CSI to have uh, control of those trademarks, whereas before all of that stuff was in CSC. So all of the assets were basically stripped from CSC and divided. Part of the, the trademark part went to uh, RTC and the money and the finance, you know, the management part and all that shit went to CSI. Right, and and you have uh, ASI as the for-profit that can pay Hubbard royalties. They could pay Hubbard royalties and then Hubbard could show income, thus he could defend himself and thus, you know, start adding some credibility to, to all of this. But L. Ron was desperate for money. ASI ended up backdating the bills, I mean... You know better than the rest. With they also had that little secret uh, fucking corporation at RRF. Yeah, the R the RRF. They were running money right. that way. And I'm going to cover that. Uh, let's cover that in a different. Yeah, interview. we'll cover that differently. But I'm just trying to set the stage that um, you yeah. know, Ron needed money. He was being sued from on multiple fronts, and he had no way of proving that the church was not paying for his legal. Now, when did you find out that Pat Broker and David Miscavige are running suitcases? Did you say they're full of a million dollars? Yeah. They're running suitcases that contain a million in cash up to the ranch. Well, I found this out uh, pretty early on, you know, because he needed money. And number one, he was desperate I mean, you know, at the time, all of this shit made perfect sense. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not even going to go. We, we don't even have to go there. You're in, you're in the middle of a madhouse, so, you know. But, you know, but yeah. um, he, he had to have money to get away, first and foremost. He had to have plenty of money to get away because he had plenty of people that were after him. And this was real. This, the IRS was, was after him. The Justice Department was after him. The, uh, yeah, and people should realize uh, L. Ron Hubbard's so-called Bulgravia policy, you know, fill your uh, pockets with money, pay all your creditors off if you have to flee, have a lot of blackmail, yeah, yeah. bribe the chief of police. No, L. Ron Hubbard had a Bulgravia plan, and he was literally serious. He, he was looking for a way, if he needed to, to flee the country. Right. But what he did, I think, because he was in poor health, he bought four or five ranches here in Southern California. Right. And he had an escape car. He had backup ranches, backup hiding places. Oh yeah, I mean, and that that all of that, I could tell you stories about that, and that they're also in the book. I could, you know, we uh, in Scientology created this thing that at the time that was called the intranet, which was the precursor to the internet, 
we had it in organizations in all of our organizations internationally over the phone line that we were able to use them in a similar manner that we use the internet today but we could do that since stats and send reports all over we through through the organization income that we uh, created and and the first modem where you transfer information o across phone lines we we built one of those created one of those from bondo and, wow. and used it on public phones and Elron was able to get information to us simply by just going to a, a public phone and sticking a receiver inside a box and uh, another phone on the other end and it would, would transmit data. I, you know, that's that, those stories are also in the book, but just it's a lot of cloak and dagger stuff. A lot of cloak and dagger stuff. Yes, yes. yes. Now, now, Jesse, something you, you don't have to tell the whole story because I know it's for your book, but I got to ask you this. What? At one point, L. Ron Hubbard asked you to sec check David Miscavige and Pat Broker. Well, n not Pat Broker. He asked me to do no. uh, David Miscavige. Someone else was asked to do Pat Broker. Ray Medoff was asked to do Pat Broker. Oh, thanks. I always I did no, didn't understand it. So Elron Hubbard asked you to sec check David Miscavige. Right. What do you think when you get the order from the Commodore? Think I, you know my thought was Miscavige is gone. Oh, oh well, you know, and and that's the way it went. <laughs> and that's really the way it went down. You know. Really? What? Well, what? How do you even did David Miscavige report for the sec check? Yes, he did. He came crying like a little girl. Yes, of course he was there. He had no choice. So you're at Gold Base up in Hemet, California. You're in your office, and Miscavige has to report to you for a sec check. Right. But you have wow. to understand, I was already Ms. David Miscavige's auditor. The first thing that, that L. Ron wanted me to do when I got there was to straighten out Miscavige's little ass. You know, he was having asthma attacks and, you know, not sleeping and not getting the correct training and not, you know... He was having issues too, so he was the first person that I had to work on. I had to grab, take his folders, go through them, find the errors, and and so Elron put me fully in control of him. There was no situation where he could disrespect me or or do anything like he treated other staff members because I was at, at that point. Elron put me over that situation with him. That's amazing. So you're David Miscavige's auditor. And at the direct orders of L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, I do his auditing. I do ethics with him, whatever it needs to be done. I, you know, I do it with him. You just become privy to a lot of things that Miss Cabbage is doing in session. Yeah. And what other people are doing, too. You know, I, 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 I get the chance to find out other things he's doing that I didn't know anything about. Well, yeah, because you have to, you know, ask him about withholds or overts, all that stuff. Right. But I mean, I was doing that with him before L. Ron asked me to actually investigate him. I guess my point that I'm trying to make, Jeff, is, is we already had that relationship. Okay. Where... Okay. Well, that, well, that's. I appreciate you making that point. So, so David Miscavige is comfortable with you as as his auditor. Correct. So it would be natural that if you had a sec check, that would be just part of what goes on in the Church of Scientology. What what made L. Ron Hubbard began to mistrust David Miscavige enough to ask you to sec check him. And what were you asked to sec check him about? Uh, well, there was no all clear, for one thing. L. Ron, you know, and that as I wrote in that recent review of Tony's book, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, he, he hit upon a real string there in his book with Paulette Cooper and, and her whole settlement. Because that, when when that happened, that's when Musca Muscavige he asked me to investigate Muscavige, and um, and that's when the IRS was coming after him so hard. We, I, I can't tell you how many times we had been destroying evidence of of advices and going through organizations just and bugging staff members and trying to figure out if there's plants. I mean, you know, all of this stuff is is thoroughly. I mean, wiretapping. All, all of this stuff is thoroughly covered. I mean, when I went to that gold base, I found out that the last thing that they do there is practice Scientology. I had to, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get up to speed quickly 
to find out exactly just what the hell they were doing. <laughs> Jesse, help me separate some fact from fiction that's been on the internet for a long time. Okay. Because you were there. Okay, now, the common view on the internet is that David Miscavige cut Ellen Hubbard's comm lines and that David Miscavige was pushing the dangerous environment racket on L. Ron Hubbard. Sir, you need me. If you don't have me, you'll get arrested and go to jail. I'm the only one I'm the only thing standing between you and prison. No, no, no. See, that's that's a myth. First off, Miscavige had no comm line to L. Ron to cut. L. 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 Ron didn't talk to Miscavige's stupid ass. He he never talked to him. I, I you know I don't know why people think that. No, Elrond sent dispatches down. You know he was very much the command line kind of guy. Whatever Muscavige got came from Pat Broker or Annie Broker. At no point during the entire time that I was there was David Muscavige himself ever in direct communication with Elrond Hubbard. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I think the misconceptions occur because senior people such as yourself who were there, we only know when you come forward to speak, which is why I'm really glad you're on Surviving Scientology Radio. It, because, bad, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, I want to get the truth out about what really went on. Sure, sure. No, Elrond so, didn't care for him or anyone else for that matter. You know, he was into his own delusion. He was the God. And we were just a little people doing what he wanted to have done. But, you know, Miscavige was nothing but an enforcer to him. And he and he didn't even deal with him directly. He dealt with him via somebody. So Miscavige was, didn't have, he could never at some point pick up and say, oh, uh, Ron or, or chat with him or uh, none of that ever. Not, not from the point that I was there from 1982 until his death. There was never a point in time where uh, Miscavige had communication with L. Ron. And that's so different because on the church's official website, you, you know, Miscavige tries to create the appearance that he spent more time with Hubbard than anyone else, that he was yelled at by Hubbard. Yeah, when they were back at Rifle, you know, doing that crazy movie bullshit. But uh, when all the oh, so legal stuff got going, no one. I I have seen L. Ron. I, was, I saw L. Ron since... Uh, uh, Miscavige did, and the only reason that happened is because Elrond couldn't believe I was a black person that knew this damn technology of his. He didn't think very highly of, you know, people of other, other races. And then to see my face up there, because see, one of the uh, some of the one of the things that I did that just totally blew him away that no one else was able to do was uh, to get his own daughter to sign over custody of Roanne, his granddaughter to the father instead of her because she wanted to leave and um he desperately wanted that child to be at the base when he arrived he wanted to raise Roanne himself he he had a special affection for that child and somehow i was able to pull that off no problems no no worries and when i did that for him i just became his golden boy and and um but then he found out that i was black and then, you know, and that's when I had to stand on that planter and let him drive around in the circle and just look at me, you know. And, and finally, I was told to not look at the car. And of course, I looked anyway. And there he was looking like Colonel Sanders with the long fingernails and the rotten teeth and shit. But he had the big shit eating grin on. He was happy. Uh, and then after that, that's when I got my Mini 14 assault rifle. He, he bought me a rifle and gold chain and all this shit. He knew who I was. He could. He could associate at that point a face with me being the pilot, pilot auditor for all of that TRD, FPRD stuff. You know, we we had very much like a Howard Hughes kind of um, a relationship where everything that he sent to me was in dispatch form, and everything I sent to him was in dispatch. I only saw him one time in my life, and that was the time I saw him. And and that's an interesting thing for people who haven't heard the story. You're told to go stand in a certain area? Test. You're told to go stand out in front of uh, where the crew uh, eat the meals at oh, at that gold base. It was called uh, Massacre Canyon Inn. MCI is where the galley is, it, it, the, where they cook, and they all sit down in large style. And so L. Ron Hubbard pulls up in a car with heavily tinted windows to just kind of check you out? Yeah. I'm told to stand on this planter and to not look in the car. 
I'm told I'm going to get in real trouble if I look and see who's in the car. I know it's Elron in the car because he was just at his house. He had just come to the base. We were all told don't stare at him and all this shit, you know. And that, but he wanted to see me, so he, he, you know, he, he drove around in a circle and he checked me out and he left and then he was happy and and that, and, and that's his way. He wanted this all clear so bad, you see. Because we worked for years to set it up for him to come. We had put all the personnel there for the shoot crew and the sound crew and 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 gotten them up to a certain point. We had run a celeb project where, you know, he wanted to make sure he had full access to Scientology celebs. So I personally, another thing that I did, I was the, the, the head of the celebrity project. I went and called for all of their files, auditing files. You know, uh, uh, went through them all for errors, reprogrammed them all, went out and sp sent special RTC auditors out to audit them all and to make them very happy with Scientology so that when L. Ron came, they would just do whatever the hell they were told. Jesse, going back to two things, you sec check David Miscavige. The popular wisdom out here or, or what you read on the Internet is that David Miscavige somehow made sure the results of your sec check never got to L. Ron Hubbard, true or false? Well, it wasn't him that did it. No, David was, you know, he knew when, when he came to me and he was crying, he knew it, it was done. It, it, it was all over but the crying, and he was doing the crying then. I mean, mm. once a person knew that if you got to me and if it didn't turn out good, you're done. It had happened too many times, you know, as I said, be, because of that, Elron wanted someone that he could depend on to be his quality control henchman kind of guy. I guess that's what I was, you know, it, it, when they, they knew when they saw me coming, it's either going to be bad or fucking horrible, but it's not going to be loud. That's for sure, because I wasn't a screamer. And uh, yeah. So, so that's the thing, you know, he came in, he was contrite, he had been crying, I had to sit him to bed, I had to, you know, make him get some sleep, I had to be a, I had to be his friend to even get him to talk because he was so upset behind it, and he was rightfully so, because, I mean, at the time, you know, I mean, wh whatever you can think or say about the guy, he worked very hard, and he did everything that he thought was right for Elrond. He was just as a slave as anyone else, and he really tried. And Elrond was notorious for being unappreciative of people like that. So, you know, Elrond didn't really recognize Miscavige. So, you know, when I when he came to me, it was like, well, if I go down, other people are going down too. Really? So, oh yeah. So the whole premise of of uh, what resulted. From that sec check was not only uh, unethical things that Miscavige had been involved in, but unethical thing uh, behavior that Pat Broker and Annie Broker had been doing. You know, he hmm. he his his thing was he told me if I'm going down, everyone's going down because I'm going to tell it all. And he sat there and he proceeded to just tell me some of the most horrific shit that I never knew, and. Um, you know, I just wrote it all down. I mean, I was so stricken by <laughs> what I was hearing <laughs> that, you know, procedure be down. I'm like, oh, shit, this is enough. I mean, I don't have to ask when, where, and, you know, fuck it. That, that is enough. You know, I'm, it, it was this kind of information. And I knew as I was writing it that Pat Broker would never, ever, ever give this information to L. Ron. So... I knew pretty much then that I, I I didn't I didn't think that the information I didn't know how they would deal with Elron to make him just not remove them instantly, but um, I knew I didn't I I knew that if that information went to Elron that you know there'd be new leaders in Scientology. He he didn't put up with that shit for a second. Do you feel like you had been checkmated by Miscavige and Broker? No. You know, I no. had a different. First off, I never really had a, a good relationship with Broker. I didn't like him because he was an alcoholic. He drank all the time. He he was like so different than anyone else. I mean, 
we were all dedicated Sea Org members, worked day and night to do the shit Elron wanted us to do. I mean, we 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 were good little slaves, and we were obedient little slaves. Pat Broker was none of that. He was an alcoholic. He he uh, perverted the technology. He pretended like somehow he was source of the technology, and he was just like and, and you know he would scare people with guns and shoot and and just do wild and crazy stuff. And and he was just like. A cowboy. It was like, oh my God, he's like some security guard on steroids. You know, he he was just was hardly even a real person. Well, how did Pat Broker even come to power? You know, I don't know. He was already there when I got there. Do you think it was because he married Annie and uh, Ron really loved Annie? You know, I tell you the type of person that I am. If I don't know, I don't go there. And L. Ron had trusted him. The wise and the wherefores. I don't know. I know Bob Miscavige, as I said, because I was his personal auditor for some years, and I knew everything about him. I knew everything about his wife. I knew everything about Mark Higger. I mean, I knew everything about the people that were managing Scientology, you know, the, what he had actually put in place. I knew everything about that because, again, I had worked with Elrond to make these people become and created them to be what they became. So in some sense, you were their priest confessor. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like the head priest. I was like, uh, under Elrond, it was there was me, you know, as far as a, a, a Division Five person, a quality control person is concerned. But what an amazing place to be, Jesse. Were you uh, on post when Elrond Hubbard died? Yes. What happened? What? Who walked in and told you Elrond Hubbard's dead? Well, it didn't go down like that at all. Um, you know, there were there were three three points where L. Ron nearly died, and I guess on the third try he finally got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first time he had an attack of uh, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. Yeah. He had that real bad, and he was rushed to the hospital. Okay, that's eighty five, and then and then he had. The stroke after the pancreatitis uh, at the beginning of the year, he had the first stroke. And you know what's what was so odd about that? When he had had that first pancreatitis, he was rushed to the doctor. He was in the hospital for some days. Dink was actually gotten and sent up there as his physician, and he worked with the doctors in the hospital with Hubbard. When the man had a stroke, they did not take him to the doctor. As a matter of fact. <clears throat> they cut out and were gambling somewhere. And um, the man didn't, they a, didn't they take off to Reno? Yeah. And then the man had a second stroke and they didn't take him to the doctor again. You know, how odd is that? Well, th this is a, a, a school of thought online, certainly, that they killed all Ron Hubbard through negligent homicide. Well, because. That's, and that's, again, I go back to that post with Paul A. Cooper. Because that's when I believe, see, L. Ron had put Pat, that's when I was asked to say, to, he put their asses against the wall. After that had happened, Pat Broker wasn't even allowed to go to where L. Ron was. He would have to sneak in at night. L. Ron told him, don't even come around until you have me in all clear. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't tell him about the investigation. There's no news on all clear. He told Pat just to fuck off, don't even come around. So what people don't understand is Pat Broker wasn't even there. Towards the for the for all of 1985, no pet broker, very little pet broker. He told him, "Don't even come here until you have this." Yeah, I heard that Pat got thrown off the ranch, right? And that uh, so Ron is down to uh, living in his Bluebird motorhome because he he's endlessly remodeling that house. Endless and, and every damn thing else, you know. Um, that property up there is quite strange. It has that house. Um, before, False uh, horse racetrack up there and uh, false hills put up there so the buffalo can roam on them. I mean, it's quite a fantasy land. I, I, I hear it's a, <clears throat> well, you know, I was I was there for a while. It's, it's, it is quite the fantasy land. So L. Ron Hubbard dies. And then what happens at, at, at the Imp base? Do, do they all run up to the ranch? Well, a certain amount of people were sent there to the ranch to preserve it and to uh, finish the work. And um, 
you know, that was, a, again, very confusing because Pat Nanny Broker had made agreements among them, amongst themselves. And I guess they just thought they were going to live out their life being served and, you know, and, and, and watch, listen to Pat Broker make up tech, pull it out of his ass, I guess the way Elrond used to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just so not appealing. I mean, nobody liked it. And, and then when Annie finally broke down and, and told the scheme to Miscavige, that was, uh, I mean, you know, one, one thing I'll say about Miscavige, I'll say this about him. When I was auditing him, and he was, you know, he he was responsible for a lot to with this whole geo thing, and and then with ASI and straightening out the money lines so that uh, L. Ryan could pay his lawyers and blah blah blah. I mean, he worked very hard, and um, I was his auditor. I would be the person trying to audit him and still do the things that L. Ryan were asking me to do with him to make him better. <clears throat> and it, it, at times it would be hard. And I remember having conversations with him. I mean, besides me being David's auditor and, and, and you know, fellow staff member, we, we were also really good friends, at, you know, at a point in time. I was at least a person he respected. We would uh, go out and do sports together and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and I would be with him for his birthday and, you know, look after him. He, he was kind of like a little brother. I, I, I treated him kind of like a little brother for a while. You know, I, I introduced him to uh, metal music, Jimi Hendrix and all of that shit and, you know, talked to him about women. I mean, we, we had a, a relationship. And one thing that he used to say to me, he used to say to me sometimes, because he'd be so tired, he would say, Jesse, you want this fucking job? You can have it right now. If you want to do it, you can do it. I'll just take off. I just want to have some rest. And I would and I would say to him, you know, I would say, David, you know, I see how hard this work is. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stand here with you and I'll do whatever is needed. But, no, I don't want your job. I don't want to be in a position where I have to do all of this shit. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable where I am, <laughs> you know. Well, that's a that's a very uh, rare insight. We've never heard about David Miscavige. He uh, his ass was on the line for a lot. In 1984, he found out that he was also the subject of the IRS Criminal Investigation Division investigation, along with L. Ron Hubbard. I, exactly. He, I found it out because I was auditing him, and he told me, you know, it came up on the roots, ARC break. Yeah, these some bitches coming after me now, you know? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I remember that very well. And and one thing that that does come out in the book, is that David Miscavige is a human just like anybody else. He was not always the way he is. That The power that he was able to amass and assume either through treachery or trickery or just plain luck was more than I, I think he bargained for. I, 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 for one, struggle with the idea that this is something he tried to do uh, I, I think he just kind of fell into it uh, to a greater or lesser degree. And he was not the way he is. You know, when, when Scientology operated, you know, with the people like that L. Ron had set up where there were checks and balances and, and things like that, he, a person like him could never come into being, at, uh, you know, as it is right now. And he was not always like that. And uh, he, he, he became what he is. Jesse, there's a, a term in corporate life called failing upwards. Yeah. Do you think in some sense he failed upwards? Completely, and he, because you see he screws everything up because, you know, he thinks he can manhandle and force his way through everything. And this is why Scientology inevitably ends up paying three, five times more than other people normally would for any legal because they do things such ass backwards, you know, in such a convoluted way. And uh, to me, all of this also uh, points back to the lack of education. Uh, uh, David Miscavige, a formal education, you know, no real formal education. I think maybe he went to high school a little bit or something. But he, he has no college degree. He hasn't, he, he hasn't 
no discipline of study. Even the subject of Scientology confounded him. He ended up beating up one of his uh, persons he was trying to audit. He didn't do well at that either. So as far as being a person that, that studies or a learner or anything like that, he, 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 he doesn't do well. I mean, he... You know, lawyers are smart. He he can hire lawyers. I mean, you know, or whatever. But he himself is not that intellectual. Paul Grady related a story some years ago that David Miscavige had a serious asthma attack, and and, and I guess Paul and some others took him to the emergency room. They got him taken care of, and David Miscavige shared with Paul, I, I had an epiphany or a cognition that power is assumed. That was his great cognition. Well, you know, well, maybe he did get a little insight there. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I, I don't doubt that because that he, he certainly assumed this. I mean, it was just there. There, you know, was, this, L. Ron made no plan. He had no plan, period. I think he was killed. I, I think he was killed by neglect. And um, I, and I think it be, it started... His, his demise started when he fucked with Pat with with uh, Pat Broker and Miscavige when he put him in that position because Pat Broker had nearly a year to figure out what he was gonna do, you know. And, hmm. uh, and Elron himself was just becoming more and more senile. And after Elron had that first stroke, that's when Pat Broker went into total action, and that's when they started changing wheels. And, and and making sure, you know, that nobody the body was never checked with. In other words, they frantically prepared for him to be dead before he was dead. It was way out of L. Ron's control by then. Yeah, and that's interesting. L. Ron Hubbard created uh, a machine that maybe he lost control of. And a couple of things that occur to me, Jesse. One, the, and this may be apocryphal, but Miscavige supposedly said the best thing that could happen is for L. Ron Hubbard to die. And yeah. it's telling that in some sense, L. Ron Hubbard did outlive his usefulness in Scientology. And in his later years, he becomes so obsessed with writing his Decalogue, his science fiction, you know, 10 volume series, Mission Earth. Mm -hmm. So that really the power is there for the taking. Right. It's, and it's there's... there's well, there's not a clear succession plan. No. There's a, there's a corporate sort out, but a corporate sort out is not a succession plan. No. And it's so and, ironic how it did happen. I mean, this is why I don't I, I don't believe in the theories that uh, it was, you know, it was a, a conspiracy by Dave because he's so cunning. It's just not the case. I mean, it, the situation uh, just was there and he assumed it because Elrond had no successor, but Miscavige did cut off the family completely from any uh, financial, um, from any of the financial benefit that they should have, by law, have gotten. Jesse, what do you see as Norman Starkey's role in helping David Miscavige come to power? Uh, I think, no, you know, I'm glad you brought up Norman Starkey. You know, I tell you, Norman Starkey reminds me of um, Thurston Howe and Lovey from that uh, old television uh, series, uh, Gilligan. Gilligan. You know? Yeah, Gilligan. Yeah. Norman Starkey, for one thing, is the only Sea Org member that, e that I ever knew that actually had a bar in his room and they drank every night. Now Norman, <laughs> Norman Starkey, <laughs> you know, with that, with that South African accent and the him and Lovey, you know, that's what they call his wife. Him and Lovey in there, and they're going to have a little cocktail, and they invite people over, and they sit and chat, and, you know. And, uh, you know, at, at, there was a point in time when Norman and I were great friends, too. And um, But Norman was actually allowed to have a, a wet bar in his bedroom. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so he'd, he would, be, he'd be like Thurston Howell. Yeah, exactly. Like, Jesse, come in for a drink. Exactly. And he's boring. Chatting, you know, he had nice glasses, and. He's the only person, so, you know, some something, you know, you have a particularly rough day or whatever, you just go to Norman's room, and, you know, you're going to have a drink, and you sit and chat about it. How does he get the privilege to have a uh, wet bar and drink? I don't know, but it was just, like, again, it was just there. <laughs> and and he was not in the Sea Org either. You know, he was... Um, ASI? ASI, yeah. He wasn't in the Sea Org, so he didn't have to go by those rules. 
Now, see, cor- correct me if I'm wrong. I've always seen uh, Norman Starkey as uh, David Miscavige's hatchet man. Well, he used he, to be the ED of ASI. He oh, okay. Used to be the executive director. director of author services. And then before that, Terry Gamboa was the ED of um, when it first started, when author services first started. And, and, and uh, Norman Starkey had a lower position. Uh, and then he became the executor. Never mind, executor. And you know, all of this stuff was just slapped together because of those lawsuits. And that's the truth, Jeff. With with Nibs coming after him, challenging whether or not L. Ron is even alive. L. Ron is no. super conscientious about the way he looks because if people saw him, no one would want to do Scientology. Who the fuck wants to turn out to be like him, you know? No, and when, as you say, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., or who we're calling Nibs. Yeah. He files a lawsuit alleging that his father's mentally incapacitated and that David Miscavige is secretly running the whole show. Right. And we have people in place at the, in the Justice Department and the IRS that are telling us they're coming after you tomorrow. We've gotten the orders. We have the warrants in hand. We're waiting. I mean, we're getting it. In, and now we're up for days, shredding shit, running, hiding L. Ron's being moved from this fucking ranch to that ranch. I mean, it's just pandemonium. Jesse, what you're what you're revealing is so important. A, a couple things that strike me. There's been, and this goes back to old internet stuff about Scientology, that Meet Emery and the IRS went in to secretly engineer this plot to take over the Scientology to get the technology of remote viewing because the CIA wanted it. Yeah, yeah. It's not like that. Meet Emery was a hired uh, former IRS guy. Former IRS guys go work as consultants. Right. There was no diabolical plot you, to take over the church from the inside or from the outside. What you're describing is a lot of chaos and a lot of church executives reacting to problems and L. Ron Hubbard reacting to problems. Right. And so there, it's very improvisational. And you know what's... What we haven't discussed, and we'll, we will break, talk about this in, in another, uh, uh, you know, if people are interested, if they want to hear some more before the book comes out. But what was also going on and that was prominent is the whole rise of the independent movement. And and that is such a fascinating story. And believe me, L. Ron knew every little detail because that's what he was interested in. He wanted to know what Mayo was doing. He wanted to know what that damn Kingsley Wimbush was doing. He wanted to know what that Ben Corden was doing. I mean, he knew who these people were, and he was coming after their asses. John Nelson, you know, trust me, we spent so much time, you know, just trying to get rid of these, trying to get rid of the people that he had already created and made. I mean, it's kind of like he makes his own monsters. He, 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 he has his David Mayo, his own personal auditor. He trashes him, does the most horrible things to him, and then let him go out in the field with all of this shit, and he knows everything. I mean, who does that? Who Who is so stupid? I mean, normally you kill people you don't want around to, to give you trouble later. They well, or, or you pay them $5 million to go away. Yeah. Or, or and, and, and I've never understood that, that the, the church only pays off after all the damage is done. Right. And what I'd like to do in a future uh, podcast, Jesse, I would definitely like to talk about Werner Erhard and Est and L. Ron Hubbard's personal order to destroy Werner Erhard. Oh, yes. We, we, I, know, I know a little something about that, too. So let's do that on a future podcast. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, we look forward to your book. Really appreciate your time. Do you have a time frame for the launch of your book? Well, you know, I'm just uh, tightening up some editing points right now and um, working out how to release it. Um, one one thing that I'm, I've struggled with with this book that's a little different than other books is the way that you and I have just been talking here on this podcast and the way I've, I've explained things. Things. This is kind of how I write. I write in a way, and and I, and I try to make it so that it's just not so serious, and, and and you actually see the fun aspects of it, the challenge of it, and I I try not to draw conclusions for the reader. I try to just 
present the information as raw as I can so that people can come to their own conclusions. But be that as it may, it's taken me a little longer to produce this book because editors, you know, they're, they're, there's a certain liability with uh, uh, dealing with the subject of Scientology, you know. What I have is a memoir, so I'm not required to document and prove every little thing. All I'm talking about is my memories, what I remember from doing something. And that's a, a legal form, and, and I, I can't be sued by that. But still, some publishers are skittish, so... A part of my struggle has been to keep the story intact the way I'm, I want to tell it without losing it to legal and editorial concerns. You'll do an excellent job threading the needle. Yeah. And I appreciate you writing your memoir. The community does. It, it, these memoirs are so very important. What you went through during a, a real crisis management period in the church is in, intriguing and we look forward to your book jesse would love to have you on the on the air again uh to talk about mission holders asked more about l ron hubbard i want you to tell our listeners about the uh 12 buckets of water he had to have his shirts washed in oh my goodness so, well you know there's so, there's endless anomalies with this subject assigned to makes it so fun i mean it, it, just pick pick a subject or a day and you can just go on and on with it then we'll do it next time. Jesse Prince has been our guest. Thank you for being with us today, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.